we try to be very concise, very brief. And this is the bad news at the same time. Our colleague Margarita Mileva from um, Bulgaria was not able to join us and she only could tell us in the last moment. So uh, there is, might be no uh, other person who could take her point of view from the, uh, Bulgaria. So we are having, uh, oh yes, so <laughs> it's not Bulgaria then, it's Slovenia, but I'm sure it's the periphery anyway. So because we all are periphery, so it, we can uh, substitute each other very easily. So, uh, I think when we are looking at that topic, the problems of the periphery of Europe, uh, what are the bad news, what are the good news, I am really interested in the good news because I was thinking when I saw that title at home, what might be the good news and I'm really excited about it and uh, I'm actually excited as well how uh, our friends here at the panel will explain to us what are the principal differences between the so-called center and the so-called periphery and the periphery is actually going from Portugal to Cyprus so a very interesting topic I think and I'm very much looking forward to hearing about it. I'd like to ask Peter Damo first to give us an impression from his country, Bulgaria. Ah, Romania, excuse me. Um, we keep it like we always did it five minutes for the start, then you are more than invited to contribute, and then we are making another round of the panel speakers. Five minutes. And All right. I will show you Thank the you. Red card. Hello everybody and thank you for uh, having invited me here. I greet everybody and I hope uh, we will have a successful uh, and productive meeting. Uh, I understand from the title of our panel that uh, it was deliberately organized as such in the wording that is first saying bad news and then good news from the uh, EU periphery because probably the expectations unfortunately are that everybody hears just bad news. However, I would like to start with, to break this, and to start with uh, some good news, if I may say so, and it's up to, to the debate and to you to judge it. Uh, there is some, something good in it anyway. So the, new, the, the good news from our point of view is uh, the former government the anti-social and anti-democratic government in Romania that implemented all the austerity measures long before the European Union uh, countries did so, fell two weeks ago. And instead we have a new government which is formed, it's a strange alliance uh, between a social democrat party, the, social, the strongest social democrat party, in fact the only one, and the liberal party, it's called Unionia uh, Sociale Liberale, which means uh, the Social Liberal Union. Now, uh, <clears throat> the issue is that uh, it's, of course, it, it's a matter of further debate and political development whether we okay. judge that this political event is in a series that started in Italy and continued in France and probably in Greece or it's just an isolated event, and what could be the outcome of, uh, of this. However, since uh, this new government uh, was put in, place, uh, put in place, some positive uh, uh, news came out. First of all, uh, they are talking now about uh, raising the salaries back to how they were two years ago, but gradually, of course, in two or three stages. So uh, trying to recover the 25% cuts in salaries, trying to uh, recover the cuts in pensions and in allocations for underage children, uh, trying to raise the VAT for, uh, to, sorry, to lower the VAT for the basic food products. 
and uh, so on and so forth. Besides that, uh, a positive uh, good news, uh, good news from trade union points of view is that they uh, practic practically formed or set up a new ministry, which is called the Ministry for Social Dialogue. And the head of this new ministry is uh, nobody else but uh, the former Secretary General of the biggest trade union federation in Romania. And this gives us hope that social dialogue will uh, be rekindled, because at least for the past five or six years, there was no, no social dialogue. It was a sort of a, a governmental monologue or dictatorship. Uh, <clears throat> so all in all, the signs seem to be good, but the expectations are very high. From trade union point of view, I may tell you that for us, it is not firstly asking the money. I mean, asking, raising the salaries and trying to reduce the cuts. but changing the disastrous legislation that was implemented by the former government. This legislation is still in place and for trade unions the most important is to try and uh, eliminate those provisions in these legislations in the, in the new labor code, in, in the social dialogue, so-called social dialogue law, to try and eliminate those provisions which restrict the right to strike which restrict the right of trade unions to go to courts and which practically postpone the, uh, all uh, the decisions of courts in favor of trade unions until 2016. So we are looking to major legislation, legislation changes, first of all. Um, in terms of not so good news, I, I won't say bad news, but in terms of not so good news is that uh, the agreements with the IMF and with uh, the financial treaties with the European Union are still in place and they are to be seemingly uh, 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 moved on. Uh, at the same time, uh, before leaving Romania, Jeffrey Franks, the head of IMF, said that he would not agree with lowering the VAT for basic products. Of course, this only reminds us about who are those who are interfering with uh, the, the, the internal politics of the countries and which uh, basically affect uh, social and political rights and social and political life in this region. I will stop now and I'm ready to uh, continue the debate and answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I think we had a first good impression about uh, a typical country of the European <coughs> East, a country who suffers still from the impact of neoliberal um, policies. And we are now giving the floor to even a country even more to the East, but I would say a bit different in the situation. Okay, thank you. Cyprus. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. No problem, uh, no problem. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I'll start by the bad news, uh, but uh, these bad news are no new because we know it will happen that way in Portugal. We are more or less one year, uh, we have more or less one year of austerity and of the execution of the memorandum with Troika. Uh, and uh, even the more optimistic on the right wing today is uh, has to recognize the failure, the absolute failure of uh, the austerity uh, measures. So the bad news is that uh, we, the country is suffering much more than we could imagine in the beginning of the austeritarian uh, uh, measures. The politics on privatization go on, the cuts on uh, health system, education system, social security system are terrible er, er, and are pushing a lot of uh, national citizens to poverty. Um, w w in a very severe way um, and follows all the, the, um, the dynamics of increasing inequalities in the country. As you may know, uh, Portugal is one of the more unequal countries in uh, OCDE, and uh, austerity 
make deeper these inequalities. By the other side, at the level of uh, social reaction to austerity, uh, the situation is not much, uh, um, much, uh, uh, much beautiful. We have uh, manifestations and strikes, but uh, they, they, they contribute, but not much, to change the perception of the public opinion on the situation. Uh, one of our major problems is that uh, all that narrative about uh, uh, being spending too much and now you must suffer, uh, the, the social um, policies were fat and now we must uh, make it thin. All that uh, was, um, uh, was interiorized by the Portuguese society. Uh, and that was terrible because all this fake history, all this fake uh, uh, narrative in the beginning uh, took the public opinion uh, attention. The good, news, the, good, the good news is that um, with the failure of austerity, people began to understand that this is no, no way to get out of the crisis. Uh, when the government make some uh, forecast on economic indicators that fail, of course, month after month, time after time, people get surprised and said, oh, this was not what they promised to us. So I think the, the better new comes from reality. Reality is making that people change the way they were uh, facing the problem and facing the solution to the problem. And this is my, uh, um, I, I, is more, is the, the point of hope more um, stronger than we have. Because, and now I'm, I'm gonna speak about the other part of the question. Uh, how shall we do, what shall we do with this change that people perceive more and more by the failure of austerity? We have a problem on the left uh, parliamentary um, side uh, of Portugal. The left is divided between a socialist party that is linked to the memorandum because they sign it and has no energy enough to break it and another part of the left is uh, assumes a position that is hard to understand for the common citizen. They say, Troika, get out of here. Uh, memorandum is to uh, finish, but they, they don't have an alternative and convincing plan to uh, uh, that allow us to say, Troika, get out. And this is a problem that I think we must face in Portugal very seriously, because uh, all the failure of austerity is not, uh, um, is not, doesn't give signs of uh, the rising of the, uh, the left, uh, the left on the left on the Socialist Party, and even on the Socialist Party. So we are having and gaining the perception of the failure of austerity, but this, this is not becoming a stronger energy for the left. And this is, uh, I think, is um, a very uh, important, uh, important point. Um, and for me, uh, I think it, it obliges to make two things. To think on what the changes must happen at the European level. Of course, they are not in our hands. They are in, in our hands, but not in our Portuguese hands or in, a, in the hands of a country. And we must think for that. But at the same time, we, we must have a response to deal with the financial difficulties uh, now, with, uh, with everything that we cannot move, and that's above us. And the, the left must work on what is possible to do uh, under the austerity that comes from above in order to reduce inequalities, in order to all the measures necessary to reestablish the financial situation of the country, uh, can uh, um, show a, a justice, a, fi a, fi a fiscal justice. And this is a point that, that I think is very important. Just, um, just to finish, uh, just to finish, let me please uh, uh, 
Um, say one thing, uh, remember here uh, a friend and a comrade, uh, Miguel Portas, maybe some of you knew him. He passed away uh, two weeks ago. And I remember him here uh, in the subject of this panel because he was a man that fight all his life, all, all his political life for the dialogue on the left. And uh, uh, is one of the major lessons he, he gave us uh, and another one, he, he, he could not separate, and uh, he was good in that, not separate the politic from the friendship. Uh, and I'd like to remember uh, here uh, him. Thank you. Sorry, it's a little bit hard for me to go on now because he, I liked him very much and I worked a lot with him. And it was a hard, for, for all of us, very hard when we lost him so soon. Um, I had the privilege to be at your Congress last year when uh, Blocco very intensively discussed the question of how to approach uh, the next election, how to approach the question of forming a broad alliance within the left. And I must say, I saw differences to the Greek situation because both parties of the radical left made m moves towards uh, thinking of unity and, and, form and finding ways to work together. But unfortunately, and I think you, know, you described it very well to us, unfortunately, the electorate decided at that time not to give you the, majority, the necessary majority to bring about into reality that perspective of having a left broad uh, cooperation reaching from left parts of social democrats to the far left, so to say. This is a pity and the other, I think, very strange situation is now that in Portugal the public opinion is very difficult to convince that uh, despite the strikes and despite the measures there is no immediate change and I think from the European level we must send more concrete signals towards especially Portugal to tackle that question. Now to Cyprus and excuse me again that I mixed up every <laughs> thing I can mix up. This is sometimes a problem. Um, but it's, it's a small shit in it. <laughs> no, no. But, but you know I, I, I think uh, with a pro progressive government and with a strong left in Cyprus. It will be interesting to hear how under these circumstances uh, the uh, crisis hit you. And it did hit you hard, didn't mm -hmm. it? Well, uh, as, to, as to there being a strong leftist government, I would agree it's leftist and not communist. Now, uh, now, the issue, the bad news from Cyprus is that, uh, well, hopefully the Greeks will not, uh, will cancel all the memoranda and the, their economy will uh, have problems and our economy will fail. The good news is that uh, the Greeks uh, might cancel all the memoranda, their economy will fail and our economy will fail. <laughs> and, uh, and I say this good news because uh, uh, precisely, precisely uh, on account of the of the ruling party, which uh, well, at least uh, nominally is the I think third biggest uh, Marxist-Leninist party after China and uh, Cuba, or after Cuba, second biggest one. Is th uh, basically, has 35 percent of the electorate. The general secretary still poses with. Uh, uh, Comrade Lenin next to him and uh, Marx, but uh, well, we'll discuss about it, how it's a different story and not a marxist leninist party and how that's the problem and not, and, uh, and, and that's the problem uh, and in the words of Locke, uh, well, the lack of hope in them or the, 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 the hopelessness gives rise, uh, the, the, the bad situation gives rise to the hope that things will change. Now, um, the best way for me to introduce the current state of affairs in Cyprus, the concrete situation in Cyprus, is to refer uh, to one explosion that um, 
Uh, I, I suppose uh, reached the uh, international media in the sense that uh, uh, it destroyed uh, 80 percent of our uh, energy capacities in Cyprus. Because uh, uh, what had happened is that uh, a few years ago, a uh, Russian ship, uh, a ship of Russian interests, delivering uh, arms to Syria. Uh, was uh, commanded by EU and US uh, to stop its trip and uh, basically force Cyprus to take it. Um, now, any calls uh, of the governing party to, well, let it loose and go back to its destination, to Syria, uh, was met with, uh, with fierce um, criticism by the right in Cyprus, saying that we have to be uh, uh, we have to listen to what the Security Council says, and we have to listen to what the EU says. Uh, the problem is, is that some interest, some very intelligent, intelligent uh, military officers decided to put uh, how many tons of ammunition uh, in a military camp situated right next to the biggest energy uh, uh, factory in Cyprus. And uh, more than that, they decided that the best way to protect it is to leave it as it is, uh, right in the under 45 degrees uh, temperature, and more than that, water it as well. And uh, so uh, there was an explosion that uh, closely uh, sent us back to Middle Ages. Um, and uh, this coincided, this explosion coincided with a glorious, glorious uh, uh, manifestations, protests, occupies in uh, basically Puerta de Sol, Spain, and Greece. And as uh, we are, uh, the hegemonic ideology, at least uh, in Cyprus, is that uh, of uh, Greek nationalism, in fact. You'd be surprised to know that uh, Cyprus is the only country, I think, in the world where uh, we have a 2,500-year history, and uh, we are not uh, constitutionally able to call ourselves Cypriots. We have to call ourselves either Greek of Cyprus or Turks of Cyprus. Uh, so due to the hegemony of uh, nationalism, uh, the, the indignados uh, of Cyprus, thousands of people practicing direct democracy were, he, were saying to hell with the fucking communists, who needs them, they destroyed the country, we want, uh, we want uh, a European <coughs> presidency, we want, uh, uh, we want a more slim state, we want uh, uh, we, 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 we want more slim state, we want uh, the Europeans to come and tell us what do we do, and uh, well, where did Agel uh, was left, the uh, ruling Marxist Leninist party? Well, since 1949, reformist, abandoned uh, basically Leninist politics, was left with uh, the following, a mass of people of its followers, uh, lacking in discipline, lacking in ideological knowledge, uh, we're feeling confused as to go with the direct Democrats or really stay true to their party. And uh, well, again, I returned. Bad news, the economy will fail. Good news, the economy will fail because then perhaps Akel will be, uh, the Marxist Leninist party will be scared of losing its voters and hopefully turn back to, well, the, the, the Marxist Leninist ideology. Thank you. So and our last speaker will be, and I will, I uh, just mentioned his name. I don't know more about him as the name. It's Primoz Krasovec, is that right? And from Slovenia. Yeah. Thanks for just joining us spontaneously. Otherwise, we would have been a little bit unbalanced between the East and the West. OK. Uh, this will be a bit of improvisation, um, because I was just recruited uh, 15 <coughs> or 20 minutes ago. Um, but I, I, I would like to take this um, opportunity uh, to correct some um, 
misinformation or misinterpretation uh, that we could hear on yesterday plenary lecture about the general, the recent general uh, strike in public sector in Slovenia. We could hear yesterday that it was a part of this protest of uh, wage bourgeoisie who are afraid that they would lose, uh, they would lose their surplus that keeps them, uh, keeps them apart from the real, true industrial proletariat. Um, now, um, people who read, who actually read newspapers before talking about general strike and uh, workers' movement in Slovenia know that uh, wages in public sector in Slovenia have, have been frozen since 2007 and that trade unions agreed to 8% um, cut in their wages prior to the general strike. So the general strike was not about wages at all, uh, but it was about working normatives mostly. Uh, mostly it was a protest against speed up in public sector. So the, the government proposals uh, for speed up, speeding up and in, intensifying work in, in hospitals, in schools, in uh, culture and so on. So talking about surplus wage and wage bourgeoisie uh, in this context is uh, complete nonsense. But you cannot expect um, uh, anything more if you let Lacanians talk about political uh, economy. Um, so uh, the other, the other um, uh, strike that was uh, also very important if we talk about Slovenia transition uh, periphery in the European Union was a strike um, in Luka Koper, in Koper Docks uh, last summer. It was a politically uh, groundbreaking strike because Luka Koper is still uh, a public, a state-owned company, but it works like completely like a capitalist, uh, like it would be. It is capitalist, but state-owned, and it works as any profit-seeking private uh, company would work. Uh, so um, uh, the, the, uh, the modern part of the copper dogs, uh, the, why they are modern capitalist company, because uh, about five or six years ago, uh, they fired half of their permanently employed dog workers and replaced them in a private-public uh, partnership manner uh, with these casualized uh, informal workers, which are supplied by uh, small private subcontractors. So basically, they fired half of their permanent workforce um, and they, they replace them by workers supplied by small private subcontractors, which actually, actually, in actual fact, they do the same work as their uh, previous uh, permanently employed uh, dog, dog workers. And the last summer strike was about uh, um, uh, equalizing, because they do the same work, they should have the same working conditions, so it was about equalizing the conditions and rehiring all those uh, people, giving them uh, permanent permanent contracts and so on. So it was already an expression between um, expression of deep and very politically conscious solidarity between those dog workers that were still on the state payroll, that were employed by the copper dogs on one hand, and those which were casualized and supplied by private subcontractors. So it was all already, again, for people who actually read newspapers, uh, you could see that this solidarity is already being built up. It's already reached a, a very a relatively high level of, of political consciousness, uh, um, uh, solidarity between workers in the state-owned companies and the uh, uh, private uh, sector in the, in the um, industrial sector. So, so much about uh, the, let's say, recent or actual events. Uh, regarding specific situation of, of Slovenia, um, I think it's uh, the specificness of situation in Slovenia is twofold. On the one hand, it's the only uh, ex-Yugoslav or former Yugoslav country which has already uh, joined the European Union and accepted the euro which puts it in a way in a special position in a region and on the other hand um, uh, another fact which uh, European Commission will never forgive Slovenia and it sent these annual, annual warnings that uh, too much of the financial sector is still state-owned. Uh, because uh, major banks and insurance companies, unlike in other, like in Croatia, Bosnia or Serbia, 
are still are still state owned i think it's 80 or 85 percent of the financial sector as a whole is still is still uh, publicly publicly operated and the european commission sends annual warnings privatize uh, privatize your banks god damn it what are you waiting for uh, so they're very displeased with this uh, very conservative uh, um, uh, financial policy of Slovenia and the, the result of this uh, still uh, largely publicly run financial sector is that the crisis in Slovenia never took uh, never took a form of financial crisis. It was actually a, a very very classical. Um, industrial crisis, a crisis of industrial sector, whatever is left of it, or a very classical credit crunch. So it's not a, it's not a crisis connected to real estate market derivatives, speculation, or anything like this, but it is a, a credit crunch. So basically, it is a, it is a final result of a 20 year um, of gradual 20, uh, process of uh, yeah, gradual 20 year long process of destruction of uh, uh, national national industry, uh, which culminated in the in this adoption of this small export oriented uh, export oriented open economy approach, which with the adoption of euro artificially strong currency, uh, with its relatively weak at least compared to Germany, Netherlands, Scandinavia, uh, Great Britain, and so on, relatively low levels of technology could not result in anything but an um, industrial disaster. And banks are now reluctant to lend to businesses because they know industrial, industrial companies will go default and they will lose their money. So we have a classic uh, uh, case of, of uh, credit crunch. So now I'll just state one, because I have only one minute left, I'll just state one, one bad news and one good news. Well, bad news is, um, that uh, recent austerity measures uh, provoked by this uh, pan-European uh, trend or austerity regimes um, hit the most marginalized social groups uh, the hardest. So basically, uh, the targets are not so much also uh, unionized parts of the workforce, public sector, and so on. But those that are hit the hardest are the, the social groups which are not unionized and cannot strike back, like uh, moms, uh, mothers with small children, um, <laughs> mothers with small children, old people, handicapped people, uh, uh, handicapped people, uh, and recipients of social aid, permanently unemployed, and so on. But the good news is already mentions uh, building solidarity between public and, and private worker. Also, there is a blocking power of trade unions, which are still uh, relatively strong in Slovenia. So they could they can block the most extreme neoliberal measures on the government, and also a stirring of let's say new new social movements, which are uh, which are addressing. Uh, uh, working class issues which traditional trade unions are not covering, and maybe I will come back to this in discussion. Uh, stop. Thank you for giving us, and now I try to be correct, an overview from the so-called periphery from the far west of Europe to the furthest eastern parts of Europe, although uh, I think now it's up to you to find out what are the specifics of the so-called periphery? I mean, I think we have an extensive uh, narrative of the situations in the different countries, and I think it would be a very interesting task for all of us to now to pick up what is the specific of the periphery and what are the expectations of the center towards them. Who wants to take the floor, please? Just a moment, please. <coughs> okay, Harris, I think you are the... F yeah. yeah, yeah, please, go ahead. Uh, if, if there is a resentment uh, against the center from the periphery? Just this simple question. If there is a resentment against the center. Oh. A resentment. The who is the center in this case? Well, I don't think it is. Okay. Uh, good. This 
Good morning, Catherine. The name is Lady. Oh, okay. <laughs> the Catherine, the name is Lady. I think this morning mentioned uh, the need for delegitimate the meaning of European Union. There is another thing which I want to say. Uh, judging at our periphery countries, including my country, I'm from Croatia, from Zagreb, from here. Uh, what we need urgently, and you, I am begging you, who are, uh, who are always in a public life, and uh, you who write a lot, uh, to delimitate uh, that, uh, I would say, you correct me, uh, let's say that is a political um, weapon uh, called... Um, uh, called uh, austeritism, austeritism, the <clears throat> the measure of savings. Uh, my deeply, I am deeply, deeply, and it's not. Uh, we haven't time. It's not the place, maybe, uh, where I will uh, can explain. While I'm very sure in that, what I'm telling, uh, that is. Uh, savings measures that is the weapon of mass destruction. This time, this time used by ruling uh, class in the world. That is something terrible what happening uh, now in South Europe, uh, periphery countries, big countries, and I am afraid very, very soon if something wouldn't be done in the rest of the Europe. Uh, I mentioned, I will mention now the Stiglitz, uh, Stiglitz two weeks ago, I mean, in Reuters said publicly, what is doing with Europe, uh, its behavior suicidal. It was the Reuters news and explaining why. So, while it's so, so I am thinking that what we have uh, to delegitimate is that that uh, saving measures, saying what is it in fact, and that is destroying people, and not only physically, but mentally and other ways. That's the theme which deserves for me special, special, special attention. And uh, that is the reason why I'm, uh, I'm from the very beginning, very, very with Greeks, very, very with Portugal, and I'm afraid for my people, I don't call Croats nation, for my people, for all a neighbor's people. A very serious situation. Uh, I want to tell you, uh, as you know, in Croatia is ruling so-called social democracy. Almost all the members of that ruling party have been the members of communist party. Almost all of them. Uh, I was in situation uh, to ask them, uh, well, you are, you are arguing that you are anti-fascist uh, party. Uh, you are for freedom, individual freedom, for freedom of nation. They answered me, high top politicians, uh, he answered me, yes, surely, we are just this. And then I asked him, how it comes uh, that you are not against financial fascism? financial fascism, and he looked me like, okay, don't talk now about it, come in my office uh, to have a coffee together and we are going to discuss it. No discussion, and I, uh, after that, of course. Uh, and I am uh, a lot, a lot of other examples. Uh, that's the one thing. The other thing I just want to say, the colleague or the young man from Slovenia, he, of course, his critical observations about a Slovenian a way of ruling, or the ruling party, whatever is going. But I want uh, to tell uh, the people who are here uh, something what is very important. And whenever, elsewhere, I am, I, am, I am talking this story, because it's very important for this Balkan. Uh, the story is following in such way. You mentioned the banks and the pressures now, official pressures from European Commission. I remember you that in uh, 2002, when the, that wild financial capital urged Slovenians to sell them their banks, 
Uh, there were, uh, at that time, the president, and you were very, very lucky to have Mr. Kuchin for president, he asked Financial Times, just half a minute, that's very important, and uh, he gave the uh, following statement uh, on the first page of Financial Times, I know that I, as the president of Republic of Slovenia, haven't tried to interfere in economic policy of my republic. But I also know that I am delegated by my nation to say all West banks that our Slovenian banks are uh, very, very served the Slovenian economy up to now, and so it will be done and in the future. That is something what we should remember. Can I all ask you please to make your comments a little bit more concise so that we have more room for different opinions? Thank you. Yes, um, this is a question for the uh, friend from Portugal. Yeah, um, you have briefly mentioned that the austerity, infamous austerity measures, are not working. Okay, uh, I know it implies spending. Uh, the question is more, what is the purpose of these austerity measures? Because they imply saving while at the same time people are allowed to keep their credit cards, all right? And then they spend money on imported stuff and the money is drained out. I mean, the very concept of capitalism is not to save but to spend. So what is actually the purpose of these austerity measures? Thank you. Yeah, um, I'd like to take something from the first two question, uh, questions. One is uh, the legitimation, the other is the center-periphery relationship. And on that note, to remind that uh, there's been quite a few slip-ups saying the peripheries of Europe. Now, Europe as a geographical um, concept is also a construct as much as the European Union, but uh, if we suspend that uh, disbelief for a while, the peripheries of Europe would be, I presume, Ireland, uh, Siberia, Georgia, uh, Malta, etc. These are the peripheries of the European Union. I think it, it's quite uh, it's quite important to um, have that distinction in mind. Having that distinction in mind, I would like to uh, ask the panel participants uh, whether I mean it's more or less the repetition of the same the first question, which is whether they feel like peripheries, and regardless of whether they do or not, are there other political entities or political entities other than the European Union that they define themselves um, in relation to. I know that for the case of Slovenia, former Yugoslavia is also a relatively valid reference point, however, in, in rather specific terms. We've heard that for Cyprus, it is also Greece primarily, maybe Greece even and Turkey before the European Union as a supranational entity. Um, and I'm wondering what it might be in the case of Portugal, maybe Brazil, and uh, Romania. Okay, I would propose, because we have a, now quite a few questions and comments on the uh, topic on the table, to give the floor for a brief response from the people at the panel, and then we can see if there are other comments coming from the audience again. Whoever wants to start here, please go ahead. Yeah, okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for the questions. Uh, I would begin for your question and then the, your series. Uh, well, the proposals of austerity. Of course, um, there is one dimension of this. There is ideological economic theory that when we look to the architecture uh, of economic gov governance on Europe, we recognize it. It was made by a dominant way of thought in economics that uh, configured the central bank as it is, <coughs> that uh, uh, elected the market as the main source of governance. And uh, this is the, the believers on austerity. Some of them are, are here. They believe the, the, the guilt is the state with its expenses with this, its incapacity to control the deficit, uh, the monetary uh, uh, economic thought, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't have any doubt, at least in Portugal, that over the, the head 
of uh, austerity, we are suffering an ideological right-wing political agenda. Our government, our majority right-wing, is proud to say to the Portuguese, we are going much far away than Troika demand us. They proud, proudly say they are making too much because the country needed so long ago these great reforms that will bring the, the growth. So, uh, and this is very complicated for the public opinion because everybody pays attention to the obligations that we have with, uh, uh, with the Troika and doesn't see that beyond of that is going an offensive, an ideological offensive against the state, against the social policies, uh, and, and with the magic solution of market everywhere. That's why we have the privatizations, everything. And this is the austeritarian romance that has been told to the Portuguese, and that the Portuguese, the majority of them, I, 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 I'm sorry for saying this, but they believe in it. They, 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 they bought the, the theory that, uh, yes, we have spent so much all that time, uh, and uh, one of the main things we must keep doing is to deconstruct this austeritarian romance. Show to the people that the beginning of the crisis is a financial crisis, and that, that financial crisis is no more than the result of that dominant economic thought. The main work I think the left must do, and all the left, all the parties of the left in Portugal can do it, because it is a, is a common ground for them, is to de deconstruct the romance of austerity. And the reality is helping us, because people who innocently believe uh, that this is the good way, now are, uh, are looking and, no, this, this is no solution for us. Because, of course, you can control the public, uh, um, the public spending, but you cannot control the receipt, you cannot control the deficit. The, it's the economic functioning of a society that, con that leads to a, a good financial situation or not. And people are beginning to, to, to see that about the resentment of the periphery uh, uh, against the, the center. I, I would like to uh, define here center. I think the center is just this ideological dominant thought on economics, on politics. This is the center. And so periphery, periphery are we all? In the center and in the, in the periphery, the ones who recognize this is our enemy, is to change the, the power that this dominant thought has over Europe. This is the center, and we all, wherever we are, in Germany, in Austria, in Portugal, in Greece, we are all the periphery. And our fight is against the, this. And is, I know it's difficult, I, I don't know if we, it can happen one day, but the fight is to, to introduce changes on, uh, on economic governance of Europe, to, to design a central bank that is a completely different, must be a completely different thing that it is now, is to increase democracy on Europe. I, I couldn't imagine 10, 10 years ago that the democratic function of Europe was uh, uh, Merkel and Sarkozy having meetings with, a, everybody knows it, in, on the backs of, of other leaders of the countries. They, they don't have, um, how to say it, the, the, um, they have no problem at all to show to the world they are in command. They are in command. They, they don't need to, to meet uh, nobody else. They decide publicly. They, they, they show the rules. Europe will follow. And this, uh, 10 years ago, I, I couldn't imagine it, it be possible. So the rebellion must come from the periphery, and the periphery are as all against this center that is stronger and is ideological, and we must deconstruct all the narrative again, uh, uh, about austerity as the salvific uh, 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 answer to, to the crisis. Well, uh, 
Uh, speaking of uh, uh, identification, yeah. Nikos, yes. Uh, Nicola, yes, yes. Nicola, it's not Nikos, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Nicola it, it basically uh, gives, uh, shows the political meaning of the name, no? So, <laughs> Nikos, uh, for whom? <laughs> uh, the other one is Laos, which is the people, no? Uh, uh, in, in terms of resentment uh, of the center, I will have to I will have to concur with my uh, comrade Nuno. Um, even though geographically we are, uh, I suppose, the most peripheral of the country, since we belong geographically to the Middle East, no, uh, it serves no purpose in. Um, in speaking of uh, special, uh, special limitations in, in times of uh, contemporary capitalism, in that it's only time the issue anymore. Uh, now, with regards to identification, uh, it, it's, it's a very interesting question that is actually cuts at the core of uh, Cypriot, I suppose, politics and uh, the governing party's policy. Uh, Akel, I suppose uh, was the only party in Cyprus which voted against entering the EU and uh, back uh, in the day. And since then, um, I remember the current president saying that, well, you wanted Europe, you can have it, in the sense that, well, this is what we get from it. Um, uh, what, the, what the current governing party is doing uh, to the spite almost of the, of the right is in light now of the recent uh, gas findings in the island which basically suddenly put us in, the, in, in a very possibly influential uh, place in the whole map of the EU since the idea is that they will bypass Russia uh, and so uh, they will be getting uh, gas uh, from us and so forth. Yes, directly gas from us. The first move of our president is to approach uh, both Russia and uh, China. Of course, the problem is that, you know, given in the whole reformist paradigm, it approaches Israel as well. Uh, and uh, even though historically Cyprus, uh, at least the left in Cyprus, um, the party, Marxist party, was uh, in solidarity, extreme solidarity with the Palestinians. So, um, in terms of, uh, there's something that Comrade Amir said uh, last year, uh, apropos the question of whether uh, Croatia should enter the EU or not, and it was still the debate uh, amongst us, and uh, amongst uh, the, 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 the intelligentsia here, whether or not it should be, we sh they should agree or not. Uh, whereas Comrade Amir spoke of uh, different coalitions that might occur. Uh, in Cyprus, perhaps this could be a lesson, uh, given that uh, from uh, the Western powers of the island, or the Western powers, England, uh, US, and so forth, got a wonderful clause unofficial in our constitution that back then in the 60s, no communist parties to be allowed on the island. Now, the reason why we had then the coup d'etat on the island is because uh, the rest of the free world decided that uh, the then Archbishop Macarius, which was our president, was the Castro of the Mediterranean. So they allowed the importation of the dictators or fascists in Greece to Cyprus, killed a bunch of leftists and destroyed our country. Now, um, uh, with regards to the, the call to delegitimate uh, EU policies, I would go with uh, the, call, the, 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 um, the finding of uh, Comrade Duzinas that Europe is dying, and the reference to architecture of uh, Comrade uh, Golemis. Now, I was having a talk with uh, comrades on the table that. Uh, uh, as we know from engineering, uh, well, the way a, a building stays in place is not the architecture, it's the civil engineering, so-called uh, pylons or columns that uh, keep it standing. Now, uh, if the columns of the EU are what they are, uh, 
uh, well, capitalist. Uh, Therefore, I think the only way, if you, if you destroy them, then you destroy the EU as it is. If you touch the architecture, you merely change the design of the space so people might feel better living in it, uh, since the columns are what they are. So, uh, perhaps in... in uh, Aris, you can take the floor any time, but not now. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, I didn't you hear go you. Ahead, please. Go ahead, because you have only one minute left, and then it's better. Uh, no, no. Mm, I'll stay here, and I would like to hear the comment yeah, yeah. of Dr. Cohen. Afterwards, but yeah, you yeah. cannot take yeah, 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 yeah. that. Peter, you, you are the last one, and then we give another round. No, no, no. Round it's, to, uh, no, he said he refused. Ah. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> guys. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to answer Harvis's uh, question, which is a very strong one, uh, if I may say so. But before answering, I think at least two concepts should be clarified. What is periphery? And secondly, in terms of uh, resentment, who resents who? Because some do resent some others, but some do not. So, Let's take them, uh, in a way I'm throwing some, some, some uh, I'm answering the question, throwing some other issues for debate here. In terms of periphery, do we consider periphery the regions from ge geopolitical point of view, from geographical point of view, or from the way, of the, uh, from the way they are treated politically? Because then, of course, you may say that even Scandinavia is at the periphery, but they, from geographical point of view, but they are not at all. So probably we should, we should discuss from what point of view, by what criteria are we saying that some regions or some countries are peripheral and others are not. Then, in terms of who resents who, well, of course, I would say that people, most of the people, trade unions, at least, to say the least, progressive trade unions, NGOs, social move movements, do have quite an extent of resentments against what, is the, what are the bodies of the, uh, the European Union. But on the other hand, those who benefit from the neoliberal politi politics promoted by uh, uh, the European bodies, namely the big companies that are doing that are having huge contracts with the state and they are funded by European funds, or the so-called governmental NGOs that are also have open lines of credit through the government from the, uh, from the European Union. Nonetheless, the, the administration itself, the, 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 most of the political class, they do like the state of affairs as, as it is, and for them it's uh, business as usual. So, then th this is another distinction which we should make. Sorry. So, <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, so, just to finish the answer of yes, those who do resent. Uh, do have some resentments against the uh, European Union bodies. Well, I would say that yes, it is yes because these bodies dictate political, economical, and financial policies in the country. They do interfere with the, the, the internal state of, of affairs, and by, the, by doing this, uh, you have a clear impact on the social life and social standards of every people. Then, on the other hand, you, EU bodies do tolerate corruption, and they, they, by this they are accomplices to the national administrations. Uh, many people say, uh, in keeping the, the proportion, that in some ways Brussels replaced Moscow in the 50s. So, if in, in the 50s orders came political and not only political, economical <coughs> directives did, came, did come from Moscow, now they are coming from Brussels and Strasbourg. I can, give, I can give you an example. In the 50s, Romania was, uh, in a way, ordered by such directives to, uh, to produce vegetables and to produce train cars. Now we are giving similar uh, restrictive uh, measures, in, uh, uh, directives in terms of uh, economic policies and so on and so forth. Uh, I stop. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I 
like to give now the floor to Harris because he <laughs> want to the friend beside. And then I want want to have another round for the for the other audience. Let's say preferable four people or five people who have ne not spoken before before we conclude here in the panel. Who wants to conclude? And then a short announcement about Frankfurt's uh, activities. Okay, um, about the resentment, uh, I'll start with a joke. This uh, German character arrives at the Athens airport and goes to the immigration officer, and the officer asks, nationality, German, occupation, no, 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 I'm here for holidays. <laughs> now, I am Greek uh, of origin, but I've lived all my life in London, and over the last two years, I've written a series of articles in the Guardian newspaper about the Greek situation, but also the European crisis. As many people know, the vitriol, the attacks that I received from British readers of the newspaper was absolutely amazing. Uh, me personally, but also the Greeks, because I was representing Greece somehow. We are cheats, lazy, corrupt, people that are not worth anything. So the resentment, in a sense, is mutual. There is a resentment from the center, Britain, towards the pigs, but also a resentment from the pigs towards the center. And this is, of course, characteristic, because in a period of crisis like this, the, the urge to move back towards your national environment and territory and people and look the other, the stranger, <coughs> the foreigner, someone who is at the basis of whatever crisis you have is extremely easy. And this is what is happening on both sides. So I wanted to make one point uh, to agree totally with the Portuguese friend about what you're saying about austerity. What is happening now in Europe, and this is happening both at the center but at the periphery and everywhere, is precisely not austerity, but a rearrangement of the way in which capitalism works in a period of great crisis which cannot, in a sense, be overcome. There is no obvious way in which Euro the European Union and the European space, at a period of globalized capitalism, can rediscover growth strategies. So what you have to do, and what I think is being done at the minute, is a reorganization of the political, economic, but also cultural space, in which certain parts of the population are totally abandoned. They become a question of policing. It is about you know, <coughs> staying outside the rich areas, do not, uh, do not get involved in riots and so on. A state of exception is being uh, introduced all over Europe. And austerity, I totally agree, is precisely the trick through which it is being done. Because of course, the question of the pigs and the problems with the supposed fiscal problem and the austerity measures are presented as a, 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 a response to that, is not debt. It is what I call the desire of debt. And by the desire of debt, I mean the desire of the ruling group, both political and economic, all over Europe and in the States, to rearrange the social bond, to destroy the traditional social welfare, social and economic rights uh, that people have won all over Europe, and introduce that new type of arrangement. And in Greece, which is far more advanced in every sense from anyone else, we now know that. The major reforms that the Greek government, the supposed socialist government introduced, were not actually imposed by the IMF and the European Union. They were their own ideas that they had, for example, to abolish collective uh, bargaining, that they had to abolish the minimum wage. The Troika explicitly said that they didn't want to do that. They changed the university law in a movement to, t to, to, to turn universities from state public universities to private. So what we're having here is an agreement between the different elites, and I'm not talking about a conspiracy, but a real happening agreement, which reorganizes the European space, both the union and the individual states, for a period of prolonged financial and political crisis for which they are adopting these measures in order precisely to stay in power. So, thank you. Uh, can I can I ask now if there is any other body, any other one who wants to take the floor? Yes, please. Any other one? Because otherwise, I would then close the list and give back to. Okay. No, only the first. Anybody? Only one. Here? One, two. 
Okay. <coughs> okay. Free. Thank you. Thank you. I come from Hungary. You probably know that uh, we are waging a freedom war now against the IMF and the EU uh, from a nationalist perspective. And uh, uh, so I just wanted to raise this uh, issue that resentment toward the center, it is, a, it is an exist existing power in terms of, I don't know, Gramscian common sense or something that you can extract political power from. And this political power is now going to the to the nationalists, uh, because, okay, so there is a historical uh, threat to that, I won't go through it, but Europe is identified with the liberal measures that were backed by the European liberal institutions, and uh, that is where the austerity measures come from, and so on, uh, and in the Hungarian terms, that is also where the continuity of uh, uh, communist uh, managers uh, come from. So the problem is that we in Hungary don't have uh, leftist vocabulary to deal with that. We don't even have the name Troika or anything like that. Uh, we only have a geographical essentialization of that problem. And uh, a relational problem of, uh, of that lack of leftist vocabulary also consists in the way uh, the European left uh, regards these peripheric problems. Because uh, in the outer globalization movement, I, I had this uh, experience, and, and here as I was uh, listening to the uh, talks, I had this experience again, uh, that, you know, speaking of, of Europe and the European left doing things, uh, speaking of this as a, as a French or as a German, it's a, it's a different story. Uh, so whenever I hear these talks, I think about the power uh, differences and the power relationships within the left. So how do we, uh, people who have this uh, strong experience of socialism. So you just cannot utter the name left, and it doesn't mean the same as it does in these countries. Uh, and how do we speak with each other? You know, we from Hungary and you from Germany, how do we speak with each other about the same left when it is only us who have to deal with the Stalinist past uh, and we have to, you know, uh, catch up with the European left as we had to catch up with the European liberalism after 89. So it, it's a relation of fact to deal with that uh, resentment. Uh, we both have to deal with that. Next is the um, friend up there. And Just a brief question to the Slovenian panelist. Uh, you mentioned the fact that the EU is constantly reproaching Slovenia for not privatizing its bank sector and the state-owned enterprises. To which extent is this a Yugoslav legacy as well? Because to my knowledge, Slovenia was the only of the republics who implemented some of the federal government of Ante Marković's guidelines for, for privatization. Everywhere else in the region of the former Yugoslavia, uh, what was witnessed was a highly criminalized privatization and enterprise of criminal politics. So again, touching upon what Igor mentioned earlier, to what extent the Yugoslav legacy <coughs> played a part here? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I have two points, one about the center and periphery, and then something, some good news from Denmark, where I live, where we come from, from Copenhagen. Um, I'd say that, as it was said from Romania, from Peter, that, um, that, that Denmark and Scandinavia is very much in the center, uh, as the political ideas and running of things uh, regarding to that. And also now, the, uh, the Prime Minister of Denmark has the leadership of what's it, what's it called, the chairman, something, and nothing has happened. So that's at least a symptom of Denmark, Scandinavia maybe, being in the center. And some good news from Denmark is that we, with our new red government, experience a, uh, our own kind of the Obama syndrome in this Tariq Ali uh, yeah, terminology. And good news is also that there's a growing leftist movement, at least in Copenhagen. We had a big demonstration against uh, ACTA, this anti-counterfeiting uh, trade agreement. There was 15,000 people at the demonstration. Uh, just now we, we, we received texts from our friends in Copenhagen who are arranging a bus trip and they're going a delegation to Frankfurt, to Blockupy Frankfurt. Um, and we had a pretty big Occupy movement also in Copenhagen. So that was some good news. <coughs> and 
Um, with regards to the center and periphery, uh, I'd say that uh, countries and places like Croatia or Slovenia or Portugal, uh, they, they aren't even periphery in Denmark, in Danish consciousness. They are just not existing. We don't, we don't hear uh, anything, but that's of course through the mainstream media, so you have to be uh, curious, you have to be investigating to find information about what's going on. Uh, and that's a point, I think, that we have to create uh, channels of commu communication outside, of course, the mainstream media uh, to create this kind of network so that we can uh, create convergence in our, in our struggle, in our battle. Uh, and then let's maybe create an, an epicenter through this uh, series of uh, events in Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask now the panel who wants to uh, summarize very shortly from his point of view the... Primoz, you haven't had the word in the intermediate round. Might be you start and give us some ideas about what you are thinking after the discussion. Um, maybe I can reply to the direct yes. question first and then uh, to this. Um, I, I cannot reply directly. I, I don't know the, the historical details about this uh, early or uh, let's say pre-independence pre uh, uh, privatization. Um, but I can, I can summarize some general policies of privatization post-91. So I, I don't really know. I would, I would be guessing if I would say how much of industry was privatized prior to that in the, in the late 80s. As far as I know, there, there was a relatively large sector of uh, private small business, but you are probably not referring to that, like uh, small shops, hairdresser, um, uh, auto repair shops, and so on. But um, after, uh, basically it was, uh, there was very, um, um, privatization after 91 in Slovenia was relatively limited at least compared to other Eastern European countries who, who had the shock therapy, this, this quick, uh, this quick uh, um, uh, privatization, privatization package or shock. Um, and it was mostly, at least in, let's say, in finance sector, in education, in healthcare, in this very touchy, uh, also in telecommunication, it was not so much this large scale privatization as <coughs> allowing the space for private competition to develop. So it, the, the, it was liberalization in a sense to allow uh, private companies, either domestic or foreign owned, to develop alongside the public. Uh, public. They were even subsidized in many cases uh, to, to present healthy competition. Uh, but there, there was no, let's say, large scale destruction of... of uh, <laughs> Um, no, we cannot, sorry, yeah. we cannot Yeah, do that. that is privatization. I mean, it's yeah. one of the basic yeah. forms of privatization by, by vouchers or certificates, as they were called. Yeah, they, they ended up after, after a couple of years, they ended up with big capitalists and... Um, yeah, I, I will stop at that. I mean, nobody is probably really interested in this historical specific of Slovenian privatization. It was privatization, it was limited, but it was bad nonetheless. Um, regarding occlusions, um, I don't know, I don't, I don't really find this, uh, let's say, abstract question of what is core now, what is periphery, how do we perceive each other, um, how do we come to deal with the terms of our own marginality, very important. I hope this doesn't sound too arrogant, but uh, what I want from such discussions or meetings <coughs> is that um, to, to, some, to somehow exchange experiences and um, how to organize strikes more effectively, how, um, how to stop austerity measures. I mean, um, if we manage to stop austerity measures or strike efficiently or organize general strikes that will, uh, that will bring uh, right-wing governments down, then it doesn't really matter how do we perceive ourselves in uh, this some kind of postmodernist sense, are we really marginal subjectivities, how our subjectivities shape each other. Well, uh, yes, uh, in ending, uh, uh, 
In all honesty, uh, as a Cypriot, uh, what I what I cannot my, uh, get my mind away from is uh, the situation in Greece and uh, perhaps how much uh, the reality there uh, I think will be uh, determining much of the history of uh, Europe. Uh, now, the comment here tells me that I should be provocative, or I should say something provocative. Uh, well, uh, no, I'll, I'll just stay at that. Uh, and uh, as a comrade uh, from uh, Cyprus, but Greek said, uh, those that uh, have uh, referred to Lenin a bunch of times, uh, now it's the time to walk the talk. <laughs> so. Thank you, Nicola. Okay, just a few comments on the language, uh, but in, maybe in, in other way. I think one of the um, one of the things that helped the ideology, the austeritarian ideology, to to easily uh, convince people was, uh, in first of all, uh, uh, a, a large number of economic concepts that people suddenly. Uh, um, had to contact um, the, 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 the budget, the, f the deficit, the everything. A and the, in Portugal, at least, uh, we have um, two, two phenomena that uh, should be studied. Uh, or or Orwellian appropriation of the words. You mean, we, uh, there is one, one expression that is um, quite curious. Expansionist adjustment. The government said that it was making an expansionist adjustment. So, adjusting for growth. Uh, but th there are several words and expressions that help the authoritarian powers and the uh, ideology to win. And again, I think we must to deconstruct all the narrative, all the discourse, all the history that, that has been told to people about the need of these times. Uh, just an example, uh, and Giovanni has participated in uh, a dictionary of the crisis and alternatives that tries to uh, catch these words and the, the way they are perverted and explain to the people what they mean and what uh, they, they, uh, how they are used to convince about the, the benefits of austerity. And I think it is a good, uh, is a good measure in order to deconstruct all this austeritarian romance, uh, accounting that, at least in Portugal, the media, not so much for subver subver uh, to be um, working for the capital or, or that, no. By lazy, they get all that, that discourse and reproduce it. And that is very important to, um, to help people to deconstruct all the, 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 the discourse around it, uh, because it's a way, I think, crucial to invert the perception about the situation. Okay. Peter? Just a brief remark, or some brief remarks. Uh, there is a question which uh, comes to my mind. What do we do when uh, a worse Neoliberal government is replaced by a government which does contain left, so-called left social democrat elements into it and into which people do believe, have expectations, but still not much happens. I don't want to go back to Italy and the expectations when Monti came instead of Berlusconi, then to France now, the expectations are probably high. In Romania, the expectations are probably high now, are, are surely high. But we keep turning back to the situation when the new uh, uh, government, which uh, uh, should empower the people, comes and says, we have to continue respecting the agreements with the IMF. We have to continue going on with the, uh, the, the agreements with the European Commission and so on and so forth. And then putting this question, uh, I would say that our approach should be both common and joint. Common in the sense that social movements, trade unions, progressive political parties, and uh, citizens, people should act together, should find 
ways and, and struggles and initiatives together. Joined in the sense that uh, I do not think it's possible to have strictly a national approach or strictly European approach. The approach should be joint that, uh, I mean, it should be European and national. And we should find that way of, of, of working together. Um, let me make a final remark because I have the privilege of closing that section. Um, I think the most important uh, words were spoken to cover the question of we were asked to tackle this afternoon. And I think when we were talking about resentments, it's, it was important to put that uh, concept together with the question of the periphery or the center and the concrete uh, tasks we have to tackle. Uh, resentments are there and they are very easily mobilized. Uh, very, very, even easier than I would have believed. And this shows us exactly where we are and where we have to be very careful. But we have to be honest at the same time. We cannot talk about resentments only. Sometimes we have to talk about realities as well. And sometimes we cannot talk about re uh, resentments of the others. We have to talk about our own resentments. As honest as we can. And finding, let's say, an Alexandrian way, like cutting the Gordic knot out of this mix of resentments and questions, you know. Like Primoz said, uh, there are concrete political tasks in front of us, and the best way is to tackle them together, and then see how far we can get with that. Because common experience is the best way to overcome all kinds of resentments and beliefs what we have in each other. And to the Hungarian comment, I want to say, I completely agree with you and the question of left, but do never believe that in the West, and you mentioned Germany, I am Austrian, by the way, um, we had never to face Stalinism and the echoes of Stalinism within our parties, but within the social democratic parties as well, the echoes are there up to this day. We never must forget that. Uh, and before I close, the, I, uh, the comrade asked me from Germany, he gives us some information about Occupy Frankfurt. Thank you very much for your attendance. <coughs>
the idea is to keep this big coalition together. And if you could manage that and get also the left party for a march of the city building, that will be a very good thing. Let's see. I'm here tomorrow, and tomorrow I have to leave. I have a couple of more informations. I would just like to say that uh, thank you all for coming, and we'd like to see you tomorrow morning for in defense of the Commons roundtables beginning at 10, also here. And for tonight, at, uh, there's a book promotion at 6 o'clock of Ste uh, Stefan Hessel uh, in Dignevois. Uh, um, Hessel canceled. He had a heart attack about two weeks ago. So uh, he, he didn't come to Zagreb, but the book promotion will be held with Predrag Matvejevic and Marko Pogačar. And at 7 o'clock there will be a round table with Bernard Kassens, Amir Amin and Eric Toussaint. And at 9 o'clock there will be a lecture from Tariq Ali. So thank you for coming and see you tomorrow.